A reading from the first book of Kings. Ahab sent to all the children of Israel and had the prophets assemble on Mount Carmel. Elijah appealed to all the people and said, How long will you straddle the issue? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. The people, however, did not answer him. So Elijah said to the people, I am the only surviving prophet of the Lord, and there are 450 prophets of Baal. Give us two young bulls. Let them choose one, cut it into pieces, and place it on the wood, but start no fire. I shall prepare the other and place it on the wood, but shall start no fire. You shall call on your gods, and I will call on the Lord. The God who answers with fire is God. All the people answered, agreed. Elijah then said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one young bull and prepare it first, for there are more of you. Call upon your gods, but do not start the fire. Taking the young bull that was turned over to them, they prepared it and called on Baal from morning to noon, saying, Answer us, Baal. But there was no sound and no one answering. And they hopped around the altar they had prepared. When it was noon, Elijah taunted them, Call louder, for he is a god and may be meditating, or may have retired, or may be on a journey. Perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. They called out louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until blood gushed over them. Noon passed and they remained in a prophetic state until the time for offering sacrifice. But there was not a sound. No one answered and no one was listening. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. When the people had done so, he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been destroyed. He took twelve stones for the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the Lord had said, Your name shall be Israel. He built an altar in honor of the Lord with the stones, and made a trench around the altar, large enough for two measures of grain. When he had arranged the wood, he cut up the young bull and laid it on the wood. Fill four jars with water, he said, and pour it over the burnt offering and over the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he said, and they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar, and the trench was filled with the water. At the time for offering sacrifice, the prophet Elijah came forward and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and have done all these things by your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me that this people may know that you, Lord, are God, and that you have brought them back to their senses. The Lord's fire came down and consumed the burnt offering, wood, stones, and dust, and it lapped up the water in the trench. Seeing this, all the people fell prostrate and said, The Lord is God. The Lord is God. Verbum Domini. <laughs> Keep me safe, O God. You are my hope. Keep me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, my Lord, are you. They multiply their sorrows who court other gods. Blood libations to them I will not pour out, nor will I take their names upon my lips. O Lord, my allotted portion and cup, you it is who hold fast my lot. I set the Lord ever before me, With him at my right hand, I shall not be disturbed. You will show me the path to life and fullness of joys in your presence, the delights at your right hand forever.
Nam nas fabescam. Lexio Sainte Evangelii Secundum Matthaeum. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Amen, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or the smallest part of a letter will pass from the law. Until all things have taken place. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys and teaches these commandments will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verbum Domini. In our own lifetime, I think it's safe to say that we have seen more change than in the previous several centuries combined. Stop and think about it. The telegraph to the telephone, to the mobile phone, to the cell phone, automobiles themselves, huh? How about the vinyl album to the 45? vinyl, to the eight-track cassette, to the regular cassette, to CDs, to iPods, to MP3 players, and the like. Am I dating anybody in regards to their age here? We've seen an increase in the technology offered in movies, computer-generated images within movies. Videos, video games, PlayStations, handheld Game Boys, computers, laptops, again, MP3 players and iPods, the Wii home console units, Walkman CD players, DVD players, VCR players, which are becoming outmoded, answering machines for telephones, internet, network television, cable television, satellite television, internet television, AM radio, FM radio, satellite radio, internet radio, Handheld Palm Pilots, Blackberries, Beepers, Pages, Cell Phones, Advertisements, Various Forms of Media, Video Cameras, Camcorders, and even Digital Cameras. Have I left anything out? If I have, I'm sure my many nieces and nephews will let me know, <laughs> because they're the ones that are up to par with all of this latest technology. All this change, huh? And yet we know that God's law does not change from today's gospel. Today's gospel is a nice summation of this fact that I've been talking about these last two days. In fact, we have the very words in today's gospel wherein Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the old law, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament, but rather to bring them to fruition in this new covenant that I'm establishing, this new testament in my blood, the eight Beatitudes talked about this theme the last two days, and today is the nice summation where Jesus actually says those words. He did not come to abolish, but to bring to perfection. But he goes on to say that nothing will change in regards to his laws. Not one minute letter of the law will change. And yet we get the idea that everything is changing. Many, especially the secular relativists, think that God's revelation is changing and that morality itself is now relative. It's what you feel. I, I personally wouldn't do it, but if you want to do it, I will not judge you. As long as you're an adult and you're doing it privately and you're not hurting anybody else, 
you can do it. Morality is relative. But Jesus says, of this much I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter of the law, not the smallest part of a letter shall be done away with until it all comes true at the consummation of the ages, the general judgment. In other words, God's word stands unchanged, and it will continue to stand unchanged. Jesus also promised the heavens and the earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away, Luke chapter 21. And the psalmist reads, Permanence is your word's chief trait, O Lord. Permanence is your word's chief trait, O Lord. And each of your just ordinances is everlasting. In other words, there is no time when any of God's chief ordinances will ever come to an end. They are in and of themselves everlasting. huh? Because God does not change, his word does not change. The Lord said, surely I, the Lord, do not change. Malachi chapter 3 from the Old Testament. In a world that's changing so dramatically... When future shock is often an understatement, it's life-saving to know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever from Hebrews chapter 13, one of the themes in the recently held past World Youth Days. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In one sense, nothing should shock us anymore, Precisely because we know that we are grounded in the truth of Jesus Christ, and he is unchanging. He is that sure mode of belief that we do not waver from. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And because we believe that precisely, nothing really should shock the Christian. But yet at the same time, the Christian wants to always give the truth. The Christian always wants to lead others aright. As the Catechism teaches so beautifully, the Christian has a moral duty and responsibility to lead himself and others to the true and the good, as opposed to the bad and the perverse. And it's because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And let us not forget that he established his bride, the church, who acts in his stead here on earth, visibly in fact. From the time of his ascension, when he visibly ascended, to the time of his general judgment, when when he will visibly descend, Holy Mother Church acts in his stead. I recently heard a priest say, a very dear friend of the Fathers of Mercy, recently told us that he was wrapping up a parish mission at a parish he was given a mission at, and one of the closing hymns for the mission, or for the mass for the mission, was, let us sing a new church into being. Let us sing a new church into being. And he was rightly perturbed by that hymn. It wasn't very sound in regards to Catholic theology or doctrine. And his immediate immediate thought was, "Uh, no thank you very much. I like the church right now as she is founded by Christ. In other words, he was saying to himself, I have no desire to sing a new church into being. I want to be faithful to the bride of Christ as he has established her. Okay? So we need to be very, very careful, my friends, of these watered-down hymns. Huh? Personally, myself, too, have no desire to sing a new church into being. All right? So in a world that's changing so dramatically, when future shock is often an understatement. It's life-saving to know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I recently read, and I honestly forget where I read it, but I believe it's 27 years that marks something as an antique. All right, So if something is 27 years of age or older, uh, it can be classified as an antique. So, you know, you go into some of these um, flea markets or swap meets and the like, and you can see these different booths set up of these uh, different items, you know, uh, everything from collector's items like lunch boxes to antique lamps and whatever else. Well, some of these things don't look too old to me, you know. 
and yet they're classified already as antique. I'm thinking, I had that when I was a boy, you know, and it's classified as an antique, all right, and especially for collectors. So things change, huh? Now, God's law does not change, and yet we often view God's laws in, dare I say, a stupid, adolescent way. The secular humanists do this. The relativists do this. They view God's laws in a very silly or, again, dare I say, stupid, adolescent, infantile way. In other words, some of us are guilty of looking at God's laws as mere prohibitions or burdens to keep away from or prohibitions of what not to do. You know, the dark cloud of authority, huh? The image of the church as a dark cloud of authority. We look at God's laws as mere prohibitions or burdens. However, in reality, my friends, his laws are actually life-saving insights into life and how to live life properly. For example, we can learn that contraceptive marital sexual relations will actually undermine a marriage by causing often alienation between the spouses, which often ends in divorce. We can learn this from God's law and instead use this revelation to actually protect and nurture marriage, as the Catechism teaches in number 2370. Or we can learn this by having our hearts broken through many, many years of marital conflict while the contraception continues. For example, and I ask this rhetorically, How many people have actually proven the truths of God's moral laws precisely by not following them and thereby have turned their lives into experiments that have failed miserably? How many people have actually proven the absolute truths of God's moral laws precisely by not following them? and thereby have turned their lives into experiments that have failed miserably. But the great good news is that there is the beautiful, awesome, triumphal sacrament of penance and reconciliation that calls the sinner back to God's own heart, completely forgiven of one's past. What a beautiful message this week, especially as we wrap up the year for priests with the official closing in Rome this week, where in fact Father Mark and Father Miguel are. We pray for the safety in their travels and for their safe return home as all those men and women, lay and consecrated, who are attending the festivities this week in Rome. Indeed, my friends, How precious is God's unchanging law. It is worth more than thousands of gold and silver pieces, Psalm 119. It is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, Psalm 119 again. Even the smallest part of a letter of God's law is to be cherished and lovingly obeyed, Matthew 5 from today's Gospel. So let us observe God's law carefully, for thus will you give evidence of your own wisdom and intelligence as a faithful Christian. You will, in fact, give your wisdom and intelligence credence to all those around you. And and Scripture says, even with the ability to convert nations. And if everybody in the nation has this wisdom and intelligence of wanting to cherish God's law, then as Deuteronomy chapter 4 states, this great nation is truly a wise and intelligent people. Can we say that about our own nation today? As much as I love these dear United States, where the culture of death has seemingly crept into our legislative process, our courts, and so forth. We need to one day soon, hopefully, sooner than later, say this great nation is truly a wise and intelligent people precisely because it is a people and a nation 
that cherishes God's unchanging law. Jesus Christ did not come to abolish the old law, but to bring it to perfection. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Nay, rather, I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Amen, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or the smallest part of a letter will pass from the law until all things have taken place. And therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so, think of abortion laws, euthanasia laws, and the like. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys and teaches these commandments and others to follow them will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. These last two days, I've talked about the importance of living the Decalogue according to its letter by living the spirit of the eight Beatitudes. And we do that in part by living an active, sacramental life. Let us each do our part to live this great message of our Catholic faith and lead others to do so as well, despite the change that we see happening around us. For the Christian, nothing should shock him or her, precisely because we are grounded, we are rooted, we have our foundation in Christ Jesus, who is the same yesterday today and forever. And despite the shock that comes our way, to have the sincere desire to always want to lead others to the truth. God bless you.